The Star Analyzer grading allows you to capture exciting spectra of stars. Oftentimes you can just screw it directly onto your astronomical camera and then capture images with your telescope. Let's start out with a telescope, which we'll show here like this. This one happens to be an SCT. And let's say we've got an astronomical camera here. Maybe it's a cooled FITS camera. Perhaps it's a video camera or DSLR. Now, before we start looking at spectra, when we're doing our typical visual imaging, when the star appears on the camera sensor, it looks like this. The size of the star on the sensor depends on the usual things, focus, telescope aperture, atmospheric seeing, the telescope's focal ratio, etc. And the star size affects the quality of our spectra, as we'll be seeing later on in this video. So now let's insert a star analyzer grading in the light path. The grating acts like a prism and splits some of the starlight into a rainbow like that. And then this rainbow appears on the sensor like that. And finally, it becomes an image on your computer. It could be a FITS image, bitmap, JPEG, or even a video stream. And then we process that image in software. Before we go on, let's answer some common questions. The first is, can I use a DSLR to capture star spectra? The answer is yes, you can use your DSLR standalone with its own lens, or you can use your DSLR to capture light coming through your telescope. If you want to use a DSLR, it's important for you to watch the DSLR spectroscopy video before continuing to watch this one. It's available from where you launched this video. The next question is, what kind of telescope can I use for spectroscopy? To capture useful spectra, you'll need to use a well-corrected telescope that has very low chromatic aberration. That would be an Apochromat APO Refractor, SCT, Newtonian, or similar telescope. Does spectroscopy require a special telescope mount? You know, because spectra are much more dim than the usual star images we capture, it's pretty important that you have a tracking mount that follows the movement of the stars in the sky. It can be a simple mount or a more sophisticated one. However, it is possible to capture workable spectra using a non-tracking mount, but it can be more challenging. Once again, see the DSLR spectroscopy video for more details. What's the dimmest star I can capture with the star analyzer? In normal visual imaging, in other words, without a grating, a star's photons fall on a handful of pixels on our sensor, like here. But when we spread out the star's photons like this into a spectrum, the same total number of photons from the star are now spread out across hundreds of pixels. This reduces your imaging system's limiting magnitude by five or six magnitudes. Suppose, for example, you can normally image stars down to, say, magnitude 13. Then with a grating, you'll be able to capture spectra of stars down to about magnitude 7. That's not a big problem because there's no shortage of interesting stars and spectra, even at that magnitude. Will light pollution from city lights and the moon prevent me from doing spectroscopy? Here's some good news. Spectroscopy is much less affected by light pollution when compared to standard visual imaging. Many advanced imagers love spectroscopy because unlike visual imaging, they don't have to always run out to a dark sky site to use their telescope. They can capture interesting spectra from their suburban homes even when the moon is bright. Do I have to use a color camera for spectroscopy? You can use a color or a mono camera for spectroscopy. In fact, mono cameras are more sensitive and have other advantages. But if you already have a color camera or are doing a lot of outreach or educational work, color cameras can be used with good results too. How do I know if my telescope, camera, and star analyzer grading will work well together? Here, let's look on the camera sensor here. There are two distances here. The first, the spectrum has an offset from the star. And the second, of course, the spectrum itself has some length from left to right. One of the things that determines these distances is the design of the grating, how close its lines are internally. <laughs> Thankfully, we won't be doing a lot of math here, but the 100 in the name Star Analyzer 100 stands for 100 lines per millimeter in the grating. These two distances are also affected by your camera's pixel size, and we'll see more about that in a bit. But here's the important point. The position and length of a spectrum like this is affected by how far the grating is from the camera sensor. When we increase the distance between the grating and the camera, the spectrum spreads out more. It moves to the right and it gets longer. 
And if we move the camera even further from the grating, eventually the spectrum may not even fit on the chip. Here's all three spectra on one screen so you can compare them. See how the distance between the grating and sensor affects the spectrum's position and length? Here, for example, in Spectrum 3, the grating is clearly too far away from the camera since the spectrum doesn't even fit on the sensor. And here in Spectrum 1, if the grating is too close to the camera, it may make the spectrum too short. This would reduce our resolution and might prevent us from seeing features in the spectrum like the absorption and emission lines we're looking for. In fact, even the second spectrum may not be ideal. As a general rule of thumb, an ideal spectrum should be about 200 to 400 pixels long on our camera sensor. With a lot of the commonly used telescopes and cameras today, you can get that by simply screwing your star analyzer grating in, just like any other inch and a quarter filter cell, threading it into the camera or filter wheel. But how do you know if that's the case? How do you know if your grating is the right distance from your sensor and if your telescope and camera work well together? And that's where the calculator comes in. I know this screen can be a little surprising the first time you see it. There's a lot going on. But I think you'll see how easy it is to really use. We're going to fill in this input section with our equipment data. The calculator then does all of the math for us and fills in this output section. And the powerful thing about the calculator is that once it's filled in, it will show us some flags over here that show us how our equipment setup will work for spectroscopy. We're going to be looking for three green flags like this one. You see, it's really pretty easy. But listen, here's the deal. If you want some help, you can click on this link and then fill in this form with your telescope and camera information. When you submit this form, your specs will be sent to me. I'll plug in your specs to the calculator and I'll email you a quick report that shows you your best options. But before you do that, let's take a look at how easy the calculator really is to use. We're going to look at just two scenarios. For the first one, let's use the popular C8 telescope. The vendor's site, of course, shows that the C8 is an 8-inch SCT and that its focal ratio is F10. Okay, so let's put that in. F10 for the focal ratio, and let's see, 8 inches is 203 millimeters, so we'll put that in for the telescope aperture. So far, so good. Now, for most of us, our seeing is about average, so we'll put a 3 in here. And let's use the Star Analyzer 100, which is preferred. We'll talk about the Star Analyzer 200 in a few minutes. So we're almost done. Stick with me here. For a camera in this scenario, let's use a ZWO ASI-178 camera. The camera manufacturer or an online store site will have the information we need for the camera. Let's go to the ZWO site here. Most sites have a specifications tab. Here ZWO says that the camera's pixel size is 2.4 microns and the camera width is 3096. So let's go back to the calculator and enter those here. The pixel size is 2.4 and the camera width is 3096. Now, the great thing I mentioned earlier that the camera's pixel size affects how spread out the spectrum is, and the calculator will handle all of this, so we don't have to do any math ourselves. So all the numbers we've entered so far are pretty straightforward to come up with, right? And finally, we come to this field number five, grading to sensor distance. This is the total distance between the grading and your camera's sensor. This camera has a nose piece. You can just get out a ruler and measure yours. That's what I did here. It's 29 millimeters. So now we just need to know how far back in the housing the camera sensor sits. This is sometimes called back focus. You can check with your camera vendor or carefully stick a toothpick into your camera to approximately measure the distance yourself. By the way, all these measures can be very approximate. This isn't like camera focusing or some other design issues with telescopes that have to be exact. Spectroscopy is very forgiving. So let's go back to the ZWO site for this camera. It shows us that the back focus is 12 and a half millimeters. So let's go back to the calculator and we'll add 12 and a half millimeters to the 29 millimeter nose piece and we get approximately 41 millimeters. And let's enter that for the grading to sensor distance here. 
So now over on the right, we have two of the three green flags we're looking for. We've made a lot of progress quickly. That's great. Let's take a look at this message. Resolution could be improved by increasing grading distance or reducing star image size. This message isn't green or red, it's white. It's simply a suggestion. It's saying that there's room for improvement. But we could go out right now and capture Spectre with this setup and get good results. The message says that there are two ways to improve things. The first one is to increase the grading to sensor distance. One way to do that is to insert a star analyzer spacer like this one. It's just an empty filter cell and it adds 10 millimeters to the distance. So once we've done that, the grading to sensor distance will be 51 millimeters. Let's enter that here. Okay, so that's 51. Ah, now we've got three green flags over on the right. This is a great configuration. We could go out and capture Spectra now. But like most technical solutions, there are options and sometimes trade-offs. So I'm going to remove that spacer and go back to 41 millimeters so that we can look at an option. Let's look at this beige message again. It gives us a second option. It says that we can reduce the star image. Well, we can easily do that by adding a focal reducer, and you may already have one. A focal reducer can be a better solution because it will keep the spectrum short and bright, which will reduce exposure time and noise. Here's a typical focal reducer. This one has a common reduction factor of 0.63. So let's see, if we multiply the 10 from F10 by 0.63, we get a new focal ratio of 6.3. So that will go here. Ah, uh, we've got those three green flags again. This is an optimal setup. We're good to go out and capture great spectra. So let's step back and see what we just did. We entered our telescope data, and we entered our camera data, some of which we had to dig up. And finally, because we didn't initially get three green flags, we had two options, either change the distance between the grading and sensor or change the focal ratio, which is what we did. That's all there is to it. Plug in some numbers and if necessary, change fields two or five to try and get three green flags. You might be wondering, how is it that when I reduced the focal ratio, I got that last green flag? And that's a great question. Remember that earlier in the video, I mentioned that the resolution of a spectrum depends on the image of the star on the sensor. If the star's image is too large, it degrades the spectrum quality. So the calculator keeps track of the expected star image size in pixels, taking into account your entire system configuration. If the star's image is too large to produce good spectra with decent resolution, the calculator warns us. By inserting the focal reducer, we reduced the star size, giving us that last green flag we needed. Once again, all of this happens automatically in the background so that we don't have to do the math ourselves. You know, it's unfortunate that the first step in spectroscopy, this calculator, is the toughest step. Going forward, things get much, much easier. There's none of this math or looking information up or configurations. But you know, if you get into a jam, you're using the calculator and you've got a question, you can always contact me. And I also wanted to mention that our online forum is a wonderful place to get questions answered. The experts in our online community have a lot of experience and know a tremendous amount, and they love to help. So if you have a question, feel free to post there, and you'll be sure to get some good answers. Okay, let's quickly look at another example. This time we'll use a different telescope, an Explore Scientific ED-102. It's a 102 millimeter F7 instrument. A four inch telescope like this is probably the smallest you'd want to use in spectroscopy. So let's get the telescope aperture and focal ratio entered here. That's 102 and F7. And let's use a higher end camera this time, the ZWO ASI 1600. Their site says that it has a 3.8 micron pixel size and that the sensor is 4656 pixels across. There we go. And this time for fun, let's use a filter wheel. Now it could be an S-Big filter wheel or any other brand, but since we're using ZWO cameras here, let's use their ZWO EFW. Here's what a ZWO filter wheel with one of their cameras mounted on it looks like. 
So here, just like the previous example, we need to know the distance between the grating and the camera sensor. And here on the ZWO side, it says that the distance between the sensor and filter is around 10 millimeters when you connect it to an ASI 1600. So let's put that in there, 10 millimeters. And this time we get a red warning. Unlike the white one that we saw earlier, this is one we've got to fix. It's not just a suggestion. One option it's suggesting is to increase the grading distance. Well, it might be possible to add a spacer between the camera and the filter wheel, but that seems like a hassle, might not be mechanically possible, or maybe it would introduce some vignetting or other problems when imaging. So the calculator's second suggestion is to try a star analyzer 200. This grading has 200 lines per millimeter, and it spreads the spectrum out twice as fast as the star analyzer 100. We need that because the grading is so close to the sensor in this setup. So here I'll click the star analyzer 200. And aha, we've got three green flags. So we've got an optimal configuration and can start capturing great spectrum. Our site has an entire page devoted to the star analyzer 200. You should take a look at it on your own. But two things to point out here. First, the Star Analyzer 200 is designed for exactly the situation we faced here, when the grading is very close to the sensor, for example, in a close coupled filter wheel. The second point our site makes is that the Star Analyzer 200 is thinner. Its low profile means that it's more likely to fit in the cramped interior of a filter wheel. And if you're one of the lucky amateurs with a larger telescope, like an 11 inch or a 14 inch, the calculator will probably show you that you need to use a Star Analyzer 200 with a focal reducer. Okay, we're done with this video. You've now seen how to use the calculator for Star Analyzer gratings. If you've got questions, feel free to use our contact form, live chat, email, or as I previously mentioned, our online forum. This has been a long and a very technical video. If you made it this far, thank you so much. I look forward to hearing of your success in capturing spectra, and I'm here to help.